ับในช่วงนี้นะคะเราได้รับเกียรติจากทาง Swedish Chamber of Commerce นะคะซึ่งเป็นองค์กรที่สนับสนุนการส่งเสริมความร่วมมือและก็ความสัมพันธ์ระหว่างสถานประกอบการข้ามชาติแล้วก็ประเทศสวีเดนนะคะรวมไปถึงหน่วยงานในประเทศไทยอีกด้วยค่ะ Ladies and gentlemen, as for this session, we are very honored to have the Swedish Chamber of Commerce with us here today. So first of all, allow me to introduce to you each of our speakers. We have Mr. Thomas l u n v i s the CEO of Opticept, Mr. Lars Svensson, the founder of Wallander and Essen for v e g of Lund, Mr. Sean Tu, the managing director of Sentinel Solution Thailand Company Limited, Dr. g o n Tan Tip, the medical and regulatory affairs director of AstraZeneca Thailand Limited, Asia Era Medical Therapeutic Area Lead. Respiratory and Immunology, and of course, Mr. Richard h u l e Managed Services Chief Operating Officer of Ericsson, and of course, our moderator for the session. He is the Executive Director of Thai Swedish Chamber of Commerce. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to pass the stage on to our moderator now. So please give a big round of applause for Dr. p o t a n a t p a t n a t a r e n ขอเสียงปรบมือให้กับท่านด้วยค่ะ Um, welcome, everyone. Um, is it is this okay? Yes. So um, uh, we're very pleased to um, to be here today. And uh, before we start with the speakers, I would like to um, to ask our president, Mr. Peter Bjork, to just give a very uh, brief welcome to uh, to all of us today. Thank you. k a p o m a k a Thank you, Dr. p o y a n a t Yes, I am Peter, and I am Swedish, and I am very proud that we are part of this Sustainability Expo 2022. Sweden certainly one of the front runners when it comes to sustainability. We are a cold country in the north of Europe, therefore I think we are very creative, and we work a lot with innovations, not least in the area of of sustainability. So. Thank you very much for coming, and I would now like to hand over to back, I think, to Dr. p o y a n a t to present the program and the speakers. Thank you. Uh, okay, k a t So since we've got six um, sets of uh, presentations today. Uh, the um, the format is going to be five minutes of presentation for each of the speakers, and uh, we would then allow another five minutes for Q and A. So um, uh, I will be moderating the session and uh, take the questions. Uh, first up, uh, we are very honoured to have Mr. Richard Hurley, uh, who is the um, uh, managed services uh, chief op operating officer from Ericsson. And he's flown in from all the way from Singapore today to uh, talk about technology for good conservation of endangered habitats through AI, um, which um, will showcase how the AI technology could be applied to so many different areas. Please give him a warm applause for welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. s w a d i k a p Thank you for inviting me to the stage today, and also thank you to the Swedish Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for inviting Ericsson to the stage, and also to demonstrate. Sorry. Yeah, thank you for inviting Ericsson to demonstrate our technology. Uh, and here today, I'm going to show you about how we can use technology for good to um, conserve endangered habitats. In using technology such as artificial intelligence. So Ericsson, you may have heard of them before. Ericsson is a big global company. We provide services for network providers like uh, 5G, and, but we also uh, are moving more into advanced technology such as artificial intelligence, AR, VR. We're also working on projects such as with the metaverse, and I'll explain a little bit more about how we can use technology for good today. So, 
We uh, were embarking on a project around sustainability in the Philippines. And as you can see on the photograph here, this is a, uh, a habitat of uh, national importance, a wetland of national importance in the Philippines. Um, there are eight of those protected sites in the Philippines. Um, and actually, this is also uh, relevant for Thailand. There's 15 of those such sites in uh, Thailand. So we were asked by our partners in, uh, in the Philippines and the government agency to help with the uh, uh, ability to take a census, the number of uh, visitors, ecotourism visitors to this um, habitat, and also to see if we can find a way to check uh, the impacts of climate change on migratory bird species. So using IoT and AI and uh, camera, we came up with a, we, we had a, a problem to solve and we came up with a solution. So I'll share a little bit about how that works. So yeah, Ericsson in partnership with the Department of Environment and Natural uh, Resources in the um, in Philippines. We basically have um, an issue in, in such space where that habitat has not got any internet coverage, only a small amount of 4G uh, coverage, so it's not efficient to send video and pictures to detect the birds. So instead, we used our AI technology with a small camera and an edge PC powered by uh, solar power, whereby the model, the AI model on the Edge PC, uh, is actually detecting the bird or detecting human activity and then sending a small GIF file back to the government agency. And that way it can be much more efficient. So here you see uh, on the photograph on the left, there's a um, camera with the Edge, uh, edge device and it's detecting people that are walking across the walkway. And as you can see here, our edge camera, it puts a small blue box around the person. It's detecting with a certain probability um, that this, uh, this, this is actually a human. And what the uh, government can do is they can detect how many people are coming to this area um, for their ecotourism census. And that way, it can also check if there's any people that shouldn't be there, like for example, for illegal logging of a wood or the mangroves, because it's a very important uh, zone for wildlife. One other thing to mention is that mangroves are very important as a last line of natural defense when there's a major storms coming in. So the government wanted to also, um, th they had a manual process for sending people by boats to collect mangrove uh, samples like seeds to do research, but it takes five days to get to this island. Um, and it's a very manual, labor-intensive process. So by using artificial intelligence, um, we can help to make that much more efficient. So this shows you um, basically uh, how we implement the technology. Firstly, I showed you about the human detection. When they realized the capabilities of AI, the, the government agency wanted to see how, how could we use our capability to um, to uh, detect birds and classify the bird species. So we received a few hundred images of uh, birds um, that migrate into that area. And then they, they basically um, are then trained as a model. We put them onto our AI model catalog, which you can see demonstrated in the, in the Swedish Chamber of Commerce. And then we then deploy that to the edge camera. And then the net result is that the birds that are there, we can detect them, first of all like you can see in the middle photograph. And then the bottom right photograph, there's a small red box around the, the bird. And this is actually classifying what kind of bird species is that bird. So now the government can use a more efficient technology to understand how many types of birds are visiting in the winter period. Um, there are also certain types of endangered species flying um, through that area and nesting there. So we can be much more, uh, we can use our technology for sustainable means. Just final quick um, comment that our marketplace for sustainability requires model providers. So experts in Thailand can provide the AI machine learning model. They can host that on our AI exchange, which is the marketplace. We need data providers, which can provide data like weather data, uh, et cetera. And then Ericsson can provide the, the, the hosting the service for them. 
as a marketplace. And through this, we can enable deployment and management of our machine learning models to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. That's the end of my presentation. So thank you very much. Please stay where you are. So um, we're going to take some questions here. Thank you very much for that very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Um, do we have any questions from, from the floor? Yes. So uh, we've got um, Kun. Yeah, uh, I'm wondering how long does it take to implement a solution like this? OK, good question. So um, the, the, the requirement, uh, oh, the camera is already available. The AI is actually something we've already developed. And basically, it depends on what kind of use case. So for this, the use case was how many birds, can we detect the birds and classify them? And the main requirement there is to get the data. So the data being, you know, the more data, the better. And bad data in equals bad data out. So good data means we get good pictures of birds from different angles. And uh, probably over a two-week period, if we have enough pictures, we can then train that model. And then we can deploy the model uh, straight away to test that out. So it can be quite a short process, actually, within a few weeks, if we have the right data. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. I think uh, the gentleman in the back, please. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the cost of the system that you are still? The cost of the system? OK, good question. I can't really reveal the commercial uh, details today, but um, yeah, we have a commercial model in place. It depends on what kind of uh, implementation you would like. So you can have a subscription model, whereby we can provide the solution, and you can have like a 12-month subscription and then you can have those models working, or a one-time, or actually a one-time payment, or you can also have another model like the Google model, where you have a per inference. So every time the model is executing, every time it detects a bird, you can have a small micro payment. But like I said, it depends on the kind of use case. So it is quite low cost, but I can talk to you offline if you want to know a bit more details about that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Kaz. So um, uh, we run out of time and. Um if you do have more questions to the speakers, please stay on afterwards because they're going to uh, stick around for a bit so you could ask questions uh, uh, off the stage. Thank you so much to uh, much. Richard Hurley from Ericsson, one of the world leaders in uh, telecommunications and also now a champion for sustainability. Thank and you. I just saw a bird flying over there, but oh. I don't have the camera <laughs> trained right now, but later on. <laughs> Thank you. Nice one. Thank you. Thank you. Right, so uh, uh, up next is uh, a very well-known um, figure in the uh, Thai-Swedish community, but also the um, um, international uh, chamber of commerce community. So please um, allow me to welcome Mr. Lars Svensson, who is the, um, oh, sorry, it's, uh, yes. I think, uh, I think the, um, the uh, uh, yeah, sorry. The um, uh, presentation is uh, is is not um, is not correct. So I think sorry, <laughs> I managed to skip the uh, the queue. Uh, so it's it's Mr. Sean Tu from from Altered uh, Sentinel, and he's going to tell us more about water conservation and what we can do in our everyday life to save more water. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Poch. Uh, okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today, I'm here basically to share about uh, water conservation. Hold on. Uh. Okay. <clears throat> I, I suppose this is going to be a very shocking question for many people. Uh, the last drop of clean water. Because uh, a lot of people are not aware that there is a critical uh, need for us to manage our clean water. Why? Let me share with you some of the information there we have gathered. Of course, 70% of the earth is covered by the water, but it is only 3% of the fresh water that is available for human usage. So. Um, um, 
actually is only 1%. <coughs> okay, and we have 2.7 billion of the world population that's currently experiencing water scarcity at least one month in a year. And this is going to be a figure that uh, for the next 10 years, there will be an increase of 40% of water consumption globally. So this is a number that I'm going to share with you on over the region, which region consuming how many liters of water per day. So as you can see, Asian is 1.5, that's about 1,500 liters per day per person. Okay, when you go to America, of course, the number go up to 2,175 liters. And if you go down to Africa, of course, it's about 480. But these numbers is growing. And agriculture basically consumes 70% of the water globally. So this make up of uh, most of the water where it goes. For commercial buildings in USA, as you can see, we, we are looking at about 500 cubic, 500,000 of water being consumed a day. So these are the breakdown. As you can see, you're going to get faucet 17%, cooling for aircon about 30%, toilet another 20%, of course, landscaping is another 22 and kitchen 13%. For hospitality, because Thailand is primarily, you're going to have a lot of hospitality industry. Uh, these are the numbers that we can we have gathered. So 30% of the waters are being used in the hotel room. So on average, each time you guys check into the hotel, you'll be consuming about 500 liters of water per stay per person. All right. And uh, from here, you'll be looking at about 50 liters of water being used while you're washing your hand, brush your teeth, and uh, well, so on and so forth. So, and this is the number for domestic consumption. So I think the co domestic consumption pattern is almost similar to the office building. As you can see, uh, one quarter, one third, one fourth of them is on uh, toilet. Of course, shower is another 20%, four set 19%, your laundry is 17%, and others is about 20 So on average, the US numbers is 120 gallon per person per day. So that, that makes up to about 500 liters per day per person. So if you keep your faucet running continuously, non-stop, okay, uh, for 14 liters of water per minute, you will be consuming about 7 million liters of water being wasted a day, a year. So, my question is, is it time for us to look at water consumption? All right. Uh, if given a choice, you have an alternative to actually clean your hand with 1.1 liter, would you be willing to waste another 9 liter? So, my question is that, would you be willing to share your resources with your community? Of course, water cost is cheap in Thailand. But then again, there are still people, pockets of community that don't have clean water to use. So which is why we are introducing this uh, water uh, technology that we can actually help you to retrofit and keep your water consumption okay, to 1.1 liter per minute flow. So this is the number that you, you are looking at. Uh, quite, quite a significant savings, something that is uh, simple but yet innovative when it comes to water conservation. So my question is that what is next for our earth? Okay. Are, are you thinking about reuse, recycle or to me is that it's more of a rethink. How do we approach conservating resources, especially water? And um, are, are we being relevant today in this context? And uh, if not, then we are, we are getting ready for the reset. Because 
it will be a different entire world when there's no water for us to use. My time is up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kun Shon, for this uh, very interesting um, uh, numbers and figures for um, water consumption around the world. Uh, we are ready to take some questions. Like, do you have any from the audience? Yes, please. Can this, can this unit be fitted to just any faucet? Uh, generally, as long as you have a standard uh, faucet, yes. Not the designer square type, but the, the standard uh, common faucet, yes, you can. Any more questions? So, I mean, if it is, as you mentioned, it's very cheap to, um, uh, to buy water in, in Thailand. Yes. So wh why, why do we need to do this? Uh, because based on United Nations survey, by 2025, Thailand will be running out of clean water. So it's a clean water? Yes, I'm talking about clean water. <laughs> Okay, so what, um, the, do, you, do you happen to know um, how much resources it takes to clean the water that we use every day? Oh, actually, it's very expensive, seriously, because well, part of my activities is actually help people treat wastewater. So um, you, 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 it's, it's kind of scary the moment that you know that a shopping mall is consuming 1,200 cubic of water a day just to run a 12 hours business. Okay, and on average, based on our understanding, you'll be looking at about almost five baht per cubic just to treat the water. Okay, and of course, uh, clean water is cheap in Thailand because it is only like, on average, you're talking about 16 to 17 baht per thousand liter. So because of that, I think most of the people don't really pay attention to because you, you are more concerned about conserving air con than water because of cost. Right. Thank you. Um, Kun Vibike, please. Um, in what uh, channels do you actually educate people on this? Because right now you talk about how we are more concerned about air con instead of the water, uh, or saving water. But I think very often it's about education. Can you share some of the areas that you share this information? Um, basically for us is that uh, as a solution provider, uh, it is in, in the course of our business, we will always talk to our customers, especially in the commercial building. We will tell them that, look, you know, you're consuming so much water. Would, would you be interested to save some water? Because you're looking about ROI about eight to 10 months, depending on the nature of business. And after that, it's pure savings. Yeah, uh, and of course, we also go to some uh, Chamber of Commerce and other business group to, to share about this. And if you are you're interested to let me to go and share in your group, please let me know. I'm more than happy to do that. Okay, come. Uh, thank you so much, Kun Shon, you. uh, for your question. So, um, again, another great uh, Swedish um, uh, in innovation to uh, help save the environment. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, uh, for the next speaker, it's uh, on midsummer. Uh, it's the midsummer solar panel. Um, and uh, we would be very pleased to um, uh, welcome uh, Kun Lars Svensson from. Um, uh, Valander and Son, but he is also the chairman for the sustainability uh, working group for the Svesham and also for the um, Joint Foreign Ship Commerce chairman for um, uh, the um, sus Sustainable Development uh, Committee. So please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Pujanat, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the talks we're doing today, we're talking and comparing technologies, but th the point is that there is a constant development. So even you go into new uh, technology like around renewable energy, it is important to keep track on what's happening. And Sweden is not necessarily known for their number of sun hours. However, Sweden is known for the music industry. And midsummer, they started producing solar panels from being a CD factory from the beginning and DVDs. So this is a story about um, a type of solar panels that helps speed up the transition of energy. 
Um, these are how the solar panel looks like when they're applied. And uh, I have a friend here, Thomas, who will help distribute some of the panels so you can feel them. They're just two millimeter. They're bendable. Uh, they look good, and they can be fully integrated into the roof. And they are hardware. You can walk on them, uh, as you can see on some of the membrane roofs, and they are very light white. Um, so this is examples of how it looks. This is Midsummer Slim, integrated into roof. Here are some traditional tiles. And you can hardly see them. You can just see them reflected on the tiles, but fully integrated on the roof. And this is for industrial, commercial use. It's used on membrane roofs. And as you can see, they're very lightweight. It's about three kilos per panel. And you can walk on them and then cover a large part of the roof area. So what's interesting with this is also very easy to do local production. And it's ultra low carbon footprint in the life cycle of the panels. And that's one big advantage in comparison to uh, traditional panels. So if you look at sustainable sources, electricity sources, uh, you have coal and power uh, on the left hand side, natural gas, as you can see, is quite a high level of the product life cycle when it comes to the carbon uh, dioxide equivalent per kilowatt hour. And then on the right hand side, here's enlarged, you have different types of panels and renewable energy. So traditional silicon on the left-hand side, still relatively high, and then hydropower, wind power. When it comes to midsummer, depending on where it is, so the first one is midsummer in Stockholm, not so much sun there, but still better than hydropower and wind power from a carbon footprint point of view. And if you do midsummer, Los Angeles even better. And uh, in Thailand, it would be even better. So down to about six gram um, uh, carbon dioxide equivalents per kilowatt hour. And here are some of the numbers then that the system cost advantage, it's not more than your traditional panels. And when it comes to, it's on equal level also when it comes to the traditional uh, PV panels production in China. And you can get a higher energy output per square meter roof. The reason why is with these panels, you can cover a larger area of the roof. And you don't have to uh, limit it because of the type of frames and stands you need to integrate it into the roof. Um, the market drivers and the change that's taking place now, you can see there is a rapidly increasing energy demand. And because of what's happening um, around the world, partially because of COVID and what it did with the logistics situation, and also the conflict now in Europe. Um, the dependency of energy sources outside is becoming more and more critical for people to be independent in the respective nation. And there's an accelerated shift to renewables. And you can see it's a declining module cost, so it becomes more and more affordable to utilize this. And if you look at uh, the full potential drivers there, you are looking in total in EU of around 7,900 square kilometer roofs near you, you can install these type of panels on. And if you compare them with other panels in midsummer on the bottom row, one is the aesthetics, the weight three kilo per square meter, um, 80 to 90% lower life cycle emissions of um, uh, carbon dioxide. And it's also uh, not using any of the polysilicon and is used with EU made uh, secure labor rights as well. Fast insulation, easy to learn for installers, and there's no roof penetration. So it strengthens actually the quality and the surface of the roof at the same time. <clears throat> and if you compare again with this flexible thin film, um, lightweight, easy installation, high efficiency per square meter, and it's the only commercialized roof with a top flexible thin film player in the world right now. Uh, and this is the unit to manufacture it. So this can be shipped in a 40 foot container and installed in a 20 by 20 square meter installation. Very small, minimal, clean room, very little uh, energy used to produce it and fast and easy transportation by non-fragile and lightweight panels. So the strength is there. So these are the advantages compared to traditional. And the return on investment of this is close to just two years and you have the money back for manufacturing it. Um, and Midsummer then controls the whole value chain. So raw material, Midsummer Duo, and the solar module, as you can see here. And that's it. All right, thank you very much. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Back on.
Right, thank you so much for that. Um, very, very exciting technology indeed. Uh, I've never seen anything like this before. Uh, so, um, any questions from the floor, please? Yes, uh, there is one, um, one lady in the back. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that uh, you would have kind of control of the whole supply chain. So I was wondering, you mentioned the raw materials. So where would those be coming from? Like, are they sourced within Europe or still having to obtain them from elsewhere? Um, yeah, so, so the raw material is actually sourced uh, from Europe. Uh, there is no cadmium in this, which is also from an environmental point of view. And over time, uh, these panels are 98 to 99% recyclable. So even though it is a fairly new technology, over time we'll be able to recycle the material completely. It's only the plastic parts, uh, when it comes to the cabling, that might deteriorate over a 20 years life cycle. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, Peter? Thank you, thank you, Lars. Uh, this panel is produced in Sweden, right? Where we have a, a very cold climate. Does it work as well in the Arctic climate as in the climate we are in here in the tropics? It works better in the tropics because you have more sun hours, etc. But what's interesting with these panels also, they can manage the heat, so they're still remaining quite efficient even though the temperature goes up. So they are even more suitable in a tropical climate. Thank you. Do we have any more questions from the floor? Oh, okay. Um, I mean, I've, I've got one about, um, uh, I think you mentioned that the manufacturing of this is entirely based on solar power as well. Uh, so how, how much, um, how much, how much, cost do you do you um uh, save by um but by you know being from uh from from the top of the uh, supply chain to uh to then the um the the final outcome of having a solar rooftop on, on your house well i mean it's a good question so as as um, if you go into and start manufacturing this you are able to uh, benefit from the cost savings throughout the whole value chain which means you um, actually can produce at a traditional, uh, at a lower price than traditional PV panels that you buy elsewhere. And the return on investment is quite fast on it. As a consumer, depending on where you are and what the energy prices are, but uh, today now, in, if you compare it to the energy prices in, in uh, Sweden or in, in Europe, um, it used to be maybe six, seven, eight years after installation, and now it's down to two, three years of return. So may I just ask you, because it's so bendy and um, it looks a bit delicate, but actually it's very strong. How, how long does it last? Do you know that? Yeah, it's guaranteed then to uh, generate efficiency power for 25 years, but um, uh, it's like a lot of, most of the panels are doing that, so 25 to 30 years. Oh, that's brilliant. Okay, thank you so much. Um, if there are any more questions, uh, please feel free to take them off the stage. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Right. Another great invention from uh, Sweden. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Right. Uh, may I please uh, invite uh, our next speaker, also flown in from Sweden, like Mr. Thomas Lundqvist, the uh, CEO of uh, Opticept. And uh, he's going to talk about um, uh, very innovative food technologies. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm representing a Swedish company called Opticet that is uh, uh, located in Lund, in the very south of, south of Sweden. And uh, we represent two uh, very te interesting technology areas. One is in uh, food tech and another one is in plant tech. Uh, we are around 40 people in our office. Uh, we are from 15 different countries and uh, very much into the research into these areas. And we work uh, globally with large uh, partners to, uh, to commercialize our technologies in different applications that we will look 
closer at later. Uh, we work mainly with two technologies uh, that can revolutionize the industry. The first is called pulsed electrical fields. And we basically apply 8,000 volts to food raw material in very, very high frequencies. And when we do that, we open up the cells of the food raw materials. So we trick the cells to release its content. And by doing this, we can extract more from the food item we're producing. It could be juice, it could be orange, uh, it could be olives, it could be wine, uh, or we could extract more nutrients to make it a more healthy product to consume. Uh, we can do this, this both for liquid foods, but we can also do this for solid foods. The other technology we represent is called vacuum infusion. And we use this technology to extend the lifetime of cut flowers, or we use it to extend the rootability of cuttings or to uh, push the growth of plants. So what we do is we put, for example, a rose that you have on this picture into this um, canister. Uh, we close the lid, we have a nutrient solution, we take out the air from the top of the canister, air goes out from the plant, and the nutrient solution goes into the cut flower. By doing this, the cut flower will look nicer, it will open up nicer, and it would also live longer. So you can, you can actually benefit from your roses at home maybe for four, five, six, additional days compared to what you can do today. And of course, this has a big impact. Um, our main, the main attributes of our technologies is that we reduce waste. You can input a certain amount of raw material and you can get out more. If you get out more, you get less waste. Uh, we improve the extraction, we uh, improve the yield, but we also produce products for our customers with a higher quality. And we can finally also extend the lifetime of the products. So why is this important? If you go to vegetables and fruit, you actually throw away 45% of all fruits and vegetables produced. Um, this is not only a sustainability issue uh, from, from the point that you're throwing away good food, but it also contributes to 8% of the carbon dioxide produced by mankind. So this is actually a huge problem. If you go to cut flowers, you actually throw away 20% of all the cut flowers produced. So if we can help extend the shelf life of food products or the shelf life of flowers, uh, they will last longer, you will sell more, and you will reduce the waste. Looking at it from a sustainability angle, we also touch on the very important um, UN uh, sustainability development goals. Uh, we minimize waste, we reduce energy consumption in the manufacturing processes of food items. We increase the health benefits of the food items that go through our processes because we can extract more nutrients into the product. Uh, we can help reduce CO2 emissions and also we can allow for new means of transportation because if a food product or a flower can last longer, you don't have to fly it. You don't have to fly a rose from Kenya or Ethiopia to Thailand or to Sweden, you can actually ship it by boat. And this can really drive changes in the world as we see it today. Um, looking a bit cl closer at our food technologies, um, we do a great deal with olives. We help olive oil producers extract more oil, uh, oil with better quality, and we can do, help them do a really, really nice extra virgin oil because our, our product doesn't increase the temperature of the raw material. So you can do an extra virgin oil that has to be produced below 25 degrees, still with good quantities and good quality. When it comes to juice and wine, we can help the producers extract more juice to the wine and the juice process. Juice with better nutrition, better taste. 
but we can also help the producer uh, sterilize the juice in the wine. So instead of heating it up, producing an ambient, not so tasty use, they can have a fresh use that will last long. Or they can produce an organic wine without adding sulfites. So this can also revolutionize, revolutionize these huge industries. And finally, we can help consumers dry products. We do that, for example, with carrots. We treat our carrots, we open up the cells, the water is released, and you can see that on the picture here, down to the right. So the water is released, so when it goes into the drying process, it dries much faster. So you can reduce the drying time with 20, 20 minutes, you can save energy, or you can produce more. Looking at our OptiBoost solution, which we talked about for roses, for example, uh, we have shown with retailers in Scandinavia that if you treat the flowers with our solution, you will have a 50% longer vase life of your flowers, you will reduce wastage with 50%, and you also increase sales. You would think you will re reduce sales because they last longer, but you don't because they look nicer, so you buy more. So, um, the technologies we represent uh, are very nice to talk to customers about. They provide a very quick payback for the investors, and they also address real environmental issues. So, we're working on this huge segment under rapid growth, and uh, um, I, I think we're really about to make a change uh, around the world going forward. Uh, and I'm also very happy to mention our uh, discussions we actually had uh, today uh, with Doi Tung Development Project, uh, Mai Fa Luang Foundation under Royal Patronage, where we're looking into a very, very exciting project with our uh, OptiBoost technology. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, again, another very impressive technology. Uh, I can see, are there any questions from the audience? I mean, I've, I've got a really simple one. So uh, yeah. um, does it taste exactly the same as before? Sorry? The, the taste, uh, does it affect the taste? Yeah, yes, in a positive way, actually, because we, ex we can extract more flavor. So at, at the worst, it's the same as fresh juice. At the best, it can be even better, actually. Okay, I mean, I'm not even going to ask you to get into the kind of like uh, the um, uh, chemical and physical uh, mechanism behind it, but um, uh, that sounds really, really impressive. So I think we've got one question, yes, uh, from Kunlosh. Yeah, yeah, uh, it looks very impressive. If you look at the application, it seems to be so wide. So, so what do you think will happen over the next 10 years and what is necessary going to happen in the food systems? I think all the big players, in, we, in, uh, especially the food industry, but also in the f flower industry, has to realize, and they are, they need technologies like this uh, to produce in a sustainable way going forward. So I, I think uh, it will come more and more, and over time I'm pretty sure it will become mandatory to use these new technologies uh, from a sustainability perspective. We can't keep on up using up uh, all our resources like we are. Great, thank you so much, thank you. Uh, again, if there are any questions, please uh, feel free to uh, take them off the stage. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Right, and uh, I would like to invite yet once again, Hun uh, Losh from uh, Valanda San, who is also bringing in uh, these um, amazing innovation uh, to Thailand to talk about um, uh, another food innovation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, actually, it's not supposed to be me uh, here talking right now. Uh, we're going to talk about potatoes. And, and Sweden is known for potato as a staple food. And we even use potatoes to make our alcohol. So potatoes is important for us. And where else would you come up with the idea of making milk from potato? That is Sweden. Um, this is the lady behind it. Uh, her name is Eva Thornberg. She's supposed to be here. She'll come in a couple of weeks instead. So we made a recording of her while well, she introduced the concept and her thinking around the milk that I'll play in the next slide. But what's interesting with her, uh, besides being a professor and doing a lot of research in Lund, 
She used to be the head research at Swedish Meat Research Institute. She's still eating meat, but she's taking over to the other side now, working with plant-based food. So here is Eva. proteiner fungerar för att stabilisera emulsioner. Det är det som är grunden till vad det här företaget Vegovlund det är just hur proteiner agerar i olika strukturer. Det är, det är basen. Det är den kunskapen som jag är bäst på så att säga. Och det är det som kan skapa nya produkter. Det tycker jag är kul nu med det här växtbaserat. Nu får vi möjlighet att riktigt ta fram produkter som vi ändå ska sälja och som man vågar sälja. Dag är en potatisdryck som består av en oljedroppar i en vattenfas. De här oljedropparna, för att de inte ska gå ihop, så täcks de av proteinet som bildat med membran runt. Sen finns det också stärkelse i. Och sen har vi tillsatt kalcium och vitaminer. Så att det är en hel måltid. Det finns väldigt mycket potatis och det är lätt att odla. Så att det är, på det viset är den väldigt hållbar. Den är ju den fjärde största grödan efter vete, ris och majs. Den kommer alltid finnas, tror jag. Alla tycker någonting om livsmedel och, och tänker att det är väldigt enkelt. Men det är inte enkelt för det är en enorm komplicerad struktur och särskilt proteinstrukturer. Och den utmaningen har jag alltid tyckt var väldigt kul. So that was Eva and as you can see how passionate she is about this and she's got a lot more in her pipeline. I'll share a little bit more about that. It's a first that we're doing here today. Uh, But as you know here also, uh, people consume a lot of plant-based alternatives here. Soy milk, for example, has been done it for ages and years. But there's something about potato that has advantages. And as I said, there's a continuous development in this area. And we know that there are aspects around the qualities around the potato that makes it even better than other plant alternatives. One of the things is it's a lower carbon footprint because it uses a lot less space when it comes to an area, when it comes to growing the potato. Use a lot less water when you're growing the potato. Low land use, as I mentioned. Um, and it's also non-allergen. So not only lactose intolerance is not a problem to consume this, but there's non-allergen, which it's the only plant-based alternative that is. And you can see the plant-based food demand expected to grow massively. So it's going to be an increasingly need. Not everyone is going to switch 100% over to plant-based. We're going to have a mixed consumption. But if you look at the uh, plant-based dairy, it's going to grow three times estimated by 2030. And when it comes to plant-based meat, you can see it's up to 18 times. And the reason why is people are more aware of the health benefits for eating and consuming plant-based alternatives. There are environmental concerns, uh, utilizing less of the resources that is needed. There are taste preferences that decides. But what's important is that the cost for acquiring, buying and consuming plant-based alternatives can't be more than your normal alternatives. So here's an important aspect about the potato-based alternative. Um, and if you compare them to others, uh, you can compare on the left-hand side, you have cow's milk uh, and you have soy, almond and uh, oat. And as you can see then, when it comes to dug, which is the potato-based alternative, it ticks all the boxes. And some of them are unique only for um, when it comes to uh, the potato milk. So the source of calcium you have there is all the same. Um, uh, there's a source of folic acid also in potato that it has that no one else has. And it's non-allergen, that's the only alternative that is when it comes to potato-based. And if you look at the right-hand side, you can see it uses just a quarter of the climate footprint compared to regular milk. Uh, potatoes have 89% higher yield per hectare than oats, and potatoes use 98% less water than almond, for example. Um, Here's our three alternatives that exist. It's a barista, it's a normal milk, and then you have one that is uh, without sugar, unsweetened version. 
And here are the products that are in the pipeline now. Soon there will be a potato ice cream launched. Um, it's patent pending. There's a smoothie. There is a poultry that will come, a potato-based chicken, potato-based red meat, cream, creme fraiche, and industrial milk used in bakeries, food productions, etc. Um, and here's one example of uh, when uh, Doug was introduced in US, you have uh, 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 Drew here in the middle, and you hear what she thinks about trying the potato milk. Do we have the sound? It's okay. She says it's great. Take my word for it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're running out of time, so um, we have time for one question from the audience. Any questions from the audience about the potato milk? I mean, I'm, I always think it's, uh, it's just um, so amazing when uh, you see these technologies being uh, translated into a real product. So is it available in, in which countries, like uh, currently? Right now it's available in England and in uh, Sweden, and we are soon uh, launching it here in Thailand and South Asia as well. And actually we got Eva with us on the remote there with Anders, so you can all wave to Eva. She's coming here in a couple of weeks' time, so. Hi, Eva. Hello, Eva. Hey. All right, okay, thank you so much. Thank and um, uh, Eva is going to be in a couple of weeks' time. If you're interested in speaking to her, please contact Kunlot. So may I please welcome uh, the last speaker of today, so um, uh, Dr. Gon Tantip uh, from AstraZeneca is going to uh, give us um, uh, a presentation on digital healthcare. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much to the Swedish. Uh, Chamber of Commerce for giving the opportunity for me to share AstraZeneca commitment to healthcare and I will share what AstraZeneca has been done so far to improve patients' life. Uh, these are the five areas on your left-hand side, are the five therapeutic areas that uh, we are in right now. Uh, we are in cardiovascular, renal and metabolic, oncology, respiratory and immunology vaccines and immune therapies and rare disease. And on the middle, you can see that uh, these are the projects that AstraZeneca is running so far to improve healthcare in Thailand. And I'd like to highlight only one project today to align with the previous sessions that talking about AI. And we also have some video uh, in the uh, exhibition hall as well, uh, which is uh, some project under the Lung Ambition Alliance. Um, the project under Lung Ambition Alliance is uh, the project that has the ambition to eliminate lung cancer as a cause of date. You can see on the graph uh, that uh, these are four stages of lung cancer. You can see that uh, on the graph it will show five years survival or how many percent of patients diagnosed of each stage will survive at year five. So you can see that for stage one, uh, if the patients can uh, diagnose lung cancer at stage one, um, the patients can live, 76% uh, of patients can live at five years, but if the patients are diagnosed at stage four, only 5% survive through five years. Uh, so this is uh, why we are doing uh, to screen and diagnose early for lung cancer to make patients live longer. We are trying to make the diagnosis uh, as early as possible uh, at stage one or stage two, where the diagnosis is very challenged. This is the pictures that is amazing. I would like to invite all of you to look on the left hand side first. On the left hand side, it is a chest x ray. Um, and normally, if the chest x ray uh, appears as dark or a black color, it means it is uh, air and it is normal. And if we have a lung cancer mass or lung cancer nodules, it appears as uh, white nodules pop up as white color. You can see on the left hand side it looks uh, totally uh, appear almost normal. But when we use 
the artificial intelligence or AI to help uh, diagnose the abnormal lesions in the chest X-ray. You can see on the highlight with blue or green color that it's pop up on the left upper of the right picture. You can see that it is the lung nodule. Uh, it is very small, and you can see from the uh, left photo that it is very difficult to diagnose by the naked eye. So the AI can be utilized uh, to help diagnose um, for the lung mass or lung nodule at the early stage where the nodule itself or the mass is very small and difficult to see from the naked eyes in this plain film chest x-ray. AI will help to highlight that and help radiologists to um, not missing it. And we have a study showing uh, in JAMA that uh, the AI has 94% sensitivity and 83% specificity for diagnosis of malignant pulmonary nodule. These are the advantages of AI for screening of lung cancer. The first one, it will help to detect abnormal X-ray, and it will highlight the abnormal regions in the chest film that uh, I have introduced in the previous slide. Uh, the program itself, the software, can identify 18 common chest abnormality, not only just only cancer, but also the other kind of X-ray abnormality as well. And lung nodules uh, in chest film X-ray can be detected at the early stage. We also have uh, a real-world evidence in Thailand that we pilot with uh, around 2,500 lung scans uh, from the chest X-ray, and we detect 30% abnormality from that. And we pick up 0.2% of the nodules that are missing with naked eyes uh, with high risk of malignancy. And for the photo here on this slide, it is uh, the program that we are partnered with Ban Pao General Hospital to run a mobile scan. And we have a grand launch in April at Central World, uh, that which we open up for the chest X-ray in Central World uh, for the public. And they can get uh, chest X-ray at that time, and the AI will have uh, interpret for the result. And so the people can get the result on time. And all the process can be ready within three minutes. So the people who travel to Central World for shopping for any reasons, they can get health check for the lung abnormality within three minutes. And these are the our plan for the projects that we, in addition to Central World in April, we also have a road shows in logistic campus of the Central Group and also uh, at Matichon Health Care Fair in uh, between 30th of June to uh, 3rd of July. And we also have an upcoming road show uh, in Q4. Uh, these are the projects that can help people to get diagnosed with lung cancer at the early stage as a purpose to make them survive for more than five years as much as possible. So making all technology and innovations together, uh, our main objective is to break through the limits of medicines to make health happen. Thank you very much and open for the questions. Thank you so much, Cam. Uh, wow. <laughs> So um, uh, I think um, you know, it's not just the technology that is impressive here, but also the partnership that AstraZeneca has with the local uh, hospitals and, uh, and authorities like DEPA, right? Okay, so uh, because we are running out of time, uh, may I please just take um, a question from, from the floor? Anyone? Right. Okay. Uh, oh, yes, Kun okay. Uh Just one question. Uh, on your road trips, how much do you do in Bangkok and how much do you do in the rural areas? Okay, uh, we're starting in Bangkok. Uh, but actually, Ban Pao General Hospital is uh, not exactly Bangkok, but uh, in... Um, uh, we, we can count it as uh, up country as well, but for the big event that we did in Central World and also the road show that we have done so far uh, in Bangkok, but Ban Pao General Hospital itself is counted as up country and they also run the scan with AI in their hospital as well, which serve for the community. 
Thank you so much, Cam. Um, because we run out of time, so uh, again, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free to send them to us, like through the Sveshjam, and also their information on the AstraZeneca website. Thank you very right. much. Thank you so much, Cam. And, and thank you to all the speakers um, here today, who's um, you know both locally and also flown in from uh, from uh, Sweden and, and Singapore and, and so on. We really appreciate uh, you being here to uh, to share these. Um, Sweden uh, sustainable technology with us. If uh, you are curious about uh, some of the technologies and would like to learn more, please come to our booth, which is uh, in Hall 3 uh, in the International Pavilion 2 next to United Nations. Thank you so much again for today, Kat. Thank you.